Good morning, this is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at SIU Carbondale. Thanks for joining another installment of our series, Understanding Our, <coughs> Understanding our New World, excuse me. And today we're delighted to be joined by David Greising, who is the president of the Better Government Association of Illinois. Uh, David has had a really interesting career. He's been a, a stellar journalist for many, many years. Um, has worked for, uh, began with the City News Bureau in uh, Chicago. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, has written for publications like the Tribune, the Sun-Times, Cranes, uh, Business Week. He's also been the Midwestern Bureau Chief for Reuters um, and came to BGA in 2018 and has continued the really interesting work as both a, a journalistic organization, an advocacy group, and a government watchdog doing really some important work. And he's joining us from Chicago. So David, good morning. Good morning, glad to be with you. Thank you. Well, David, as I was reading about your career, I was struck by, I looked at, I guess, the, the alumni magazine at DePaul University and read about a situation where you were the editor in chief of the school newspaper and you came at you, I guess you were in a meeting with the president where maybe there was an issue of, of, the, of the awarding of an honorary degree. And then at the end of the meeting, he said, this is all off the record. So pick up, pick up the story from there. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a memorable event in my career. Um, I was in the meeting. We had a, I was the editor of the school paper, which was independent of the university. And the president declared it was off the record. Uh, my reporter came back and noted that, and I said, you know, you, uh, you, you know, off the record is an agreement between a reporter and a source. Nobody can just declare a meeting to be off the record. Uh, the, the, the local radio station published one story about it, the university radio station. The president called and bullied them into not doing any more coverage of it. He called me to try to get me to not cover it because we, we weren't a daily. We, we, had, we had another day before we published. And I just told him, I said, I'm sorry. I, you can't do that. You can't do that. And we're independent. You basically have no authority to tell me I can't publish. We're publishing. And uh, that was for me. I, at that point, I thought I wanted to go to law school. Um, that was for me the moment at which I really realized how much fun journalism can be and standing up to somebody in a position of real power. And then uh, just jumping forward, I left. Um, I got a job at the City News Bureau right out of college, thinking that was going to be a holding pattern until I got into, um, I, get, I was admitted to Northwestern Law, but I deferred admission just to get journalism out of my system for a year. Wound up covering Harold Washington running for mayor, covered a, a, a rare serial murder case at that point, the Tylenol murders, and uh, I never went to law school, just loved journalism so much I stuck with it. Well, I mean, let's talk a little bit about this, the City News Bureau, because it's this fabled journalistic entity, and re, unfortunately, it's closed down. But I was reading a, a profile of it in the New York Times, and they describe it as a fixture in American journalism that trained Mike Royko, Kurt Vonnegut, Seymour Hirsch, and legions of other gritty reporters. I think you would follow in that footstep. Tell us a little bit about why that's such an important institution, what you learned when you were there. <laughs> yeah, you learn a lot there, uh, and you learn it the hard way. It really was a journalism boot camp, and they prided themselves on uh, on uh, really basically hazing people who knew nothing about journalism and turning them into journalists in a remarkably short period of time. Just to give you one example, my first story, I was covering a protest in Grant Park, uh, and the, I called in the story to the editor and asked me, well, what is the address? <laughs> to the address is it's grand park well we need a street address give me a street address uh we had to get the name middle initial age and, a, and home address of everybody that we talked to uh the they drilled into you accuracy and skepticism the byword was if your mother sh says she loves you check it out uh, don't take anything anybody says at face value in other words um and so it was really really a, a and also you had exposure at a young age to the top stories. Uh, you know, I was covering that Tylenol murder, which was the biggest crime story in the city at the time. I was covering Harold Washington and the newspapers at that point didn't think he had any chance. They weren't even sending reporters to cover him. And I was sitting in the back of his limousine before campaign stops talking to him and he became the mayor. I was sick, you know, I was less than six months out of college doing this stuff. So it was a real sort of just throw them in the swimming pool, hope they can learn to swim. And if they did, they might become a reporter one day. 
Well, so then when you, you left that, I mean, you've had this, you know, you've worked for some, you know, the who's who of Chicago journalism, Sun-Times, you know, Cranes, Tribune, Reuters, as a Midwest bureau chief. As you look back on your career, what has been kind of the through line? I know I, I've heard you described as the, the quintessential Chicago journalist. Is it, um, is it the city itself and all of its various dimensions? Is it particularly politics? Is it the intersection of politics and business? What, what, what is it about covering Chicago that has pulled you in so fully? Well, I, I spent much, much of my career as a business journalist. And so I, I do have that business background. And, and I, would, I would say to anybody interested in journalism, both either practicing it or reading it, uh, knowing a little bit about numbers is a huge advantage to anybody. Uh, understanding budgets and, and such is so essential to understanding how government functions, much less business. Um, and so the, there would be two through lines. Um, one is kind of a very data centric approach to reporting uh, that I think serves any journalist well and serves the public well, serves readers very well if we really understand data. And, and you're right, uh, Chicago is the big through line. And uh, what's interesting to, to, and I've traveled all over the world as a journalist for a while, I was. Uh, the chief business correspondent of the Tribune, my job was to travel all, all over the world and write about how globalization is affecting Chicago. Uh, I grew up in the Chicago area. I was born in the city. Um, uh, I've worked, I've lived outside the city, but um, the, the, the story of this city, this great American city and all of its problems and potential is, is just all encompassing in a lot of different ways. We tend to be somewhat parochial, but that's partly because we got so much going on. Other places often are just not quite as interesting. The stakes are really high. We're such a big city. Uh, we've got all the issues of violence, race, uh, financial mismanagement, corruption, et cetera. What journalists would want to kind of go anywhere else from my perspective? And now um, I started my job at sort of my career, and I think you, you John, similarly, at sort of peak journalism. <laughs> Budgets were were unlimited. If you needed to travel for a story, you could. Uh, um, newsrooms were full of reporters, and we've gone through this period where the future of journalism has been in doubt. I feel very fortunate right now to be in journalism, in nonprofit journalism in the city of Chicago, where we have this great kind of resurgence and rebuilding going on, and and so um, the. And, and I, I'm privileged to be writing about or, or and mainly directing people writing about uh, this great city at this very important time at a moment in journalism where we're finding a path toward a future life of sustainability. And, and so um, that's become sort of the third leg of my career stool of kind of the reinvention of journalism. And I, I really feel very fortunate to be a part of that right now. Great. I want to circle back to that. But before I do, I want to ask a little bit about your book writing, because you've written, I think, three books on your own. I think you wrote a book also with your wife. And one of them was on uh, a CEO of Coca-Cola. Um, and another one was on the um, an FBI probe of the futures industry in Chicago. Talk just maybe more broadly about book writing and, and how you view that challenge as distinct from daily journalism, what this sort of the various trade-offs between writing a book and, and writing uh, and doing daily journalism. Yeah, I, I guess I would encourage any journalist uh, to think about writing at least one or two books during the course of their career. It's a different form of storytelling, uh, obviously super long form. Um, the the you have the opportunity in writing a book to, first of all, place a big story into perspective. Um, why does this matter? Because if it doesn't matter, people aren't going to buy the book. And so you have to really think about that. In fact, when people who are thinking about books approach me and ask, hey, I'm thinking about writing a book, I, I always ask, can you picture somebody walking into the bookstore and saying, where's that book about X, Y, or Z? And if if not, and, and maybe people don't really walk into bookstores anymore, but if you can't picture somebody kind of seeking out your book Maybe it's not worth the 18 months or so it takes at least to write a decent book. And, and so that that's one thing. Um, the, the process of book writing uh, is just is like nothing that daily or, or even uh, magazine journalism can deliver to you as a journalist. You 
the depth, uh, the detail you get, the, the luxury of time, the opportunity to track down sources over periods of weeks and months when normally if they dodge you for a few days, you've moved on to something else, depending on the kind of reporting you're doing. Um, the ability to right, pull the story, pull the, the narrative threads through such a long time are just completely different than anything a, a, a typical journalist often does. And um, and at the end of the day, you have something that looks nice on a bookshelf. So uh, uh, it it's a it's some it's a way to I, take a moment and put a marker down for the purpose of history to say this is an important topic. This is what I understand what really happened. And and I, I've had great pleasure from the three business uh, you know business and and politics books I've done as well as. Uh, the one I did with my wife, which was a children's book. Yeah, I want to come back to that in, in, in a little bit. Well, let's talk about the BGA. And I looked at your website, and um, you know, you're all, you'll be a hundred years old next year, and you had this story tradition of fighting corruption, waste, secrecy, and inequity, shining a spotlight on how government works. Um, tell us about uh, tell us about the BGA. I mean, what it's kind of singular mission is. Yeah, uh, uh, transparency, equity, and accountability in government is really our, our focus. And we do that both through uh, in investigative reporting, which is what we are best known for, and also through uh, uh, policy advocacy, fighting for open and accountable government. Um, we're, we were started in, in 1923 at a period when Al Capone was rising through the ranks of, or, of the mob and a uh, city hall was bought and paid for by the mob and a group of clergy, business people, elected officials and journalists got together and said, hey, we've got to do something about this. And they formed the Better Government Association, which for the first 40 or so years was really mainly about its policy work and then added on journalism as an important tool for eventually effectuating better policy. Uh, we famously in, 19, in the early 1970s purchased a tavern, the Mirage Tavern, along with the Chicago Sun-Times, and just kind of opened up shop and saw what happened. And uh, we had fire inspectors and health inspectors and building inspectors coming through, wanting envelopes full of cash uh, in order to give a uh, uh, passing grade to this very broken down old tavern with leaky pipes open open electric wires, all kinds of dangerous things that should have been um, amended. And um, that was in part a great uh, story because we we put a um, photo nest up above the restroom and the photographers could look through a hole in the wall and take pictures of these people actually taking these envelopes full of cash. And that series ran for several weeks in the Sun-Times. It ended up leading a statewide reform of building inspections. Um, and that's the, that's really the kind of journalism, the kind of go for it journalism that the BJ is best known for. We still do that today. Um, we won the Pulitzer Prize this year for a, a uh, our first, by the way, um, for a story, a series that we did about fire safety inspections in the city of Chicago. Our reporter working with Chicago Tribune found that 61 people died in fires that the city of Chicago knew to have fire dangers either because they inspected the buildings and did nothing or people reported fire problems and the city didn't even bother to come out and inspect. And that just to me shows the legacy of, of the journalism side. On the policy side, we're in the thick of fighting for ethical and accountable government and uh, fighting for transparency. We file lawsuits and fight them to the very bitter end. We've been involved in a lawsuit against Navy Pier, which was spun off by the government Metropolitan Pier and Exposition Authority and yet still has control of this valuable city asset. And we have won a Supreme Court ruling that in fact, Navy Pier has to be responsive to Freedom of Information Act requests. So we use litigation and policy work to effectuate reform and our journalists come up with uh, reporting that discovers breakdowns in government. Now, I know at one point you had bureaus in DC, Springfield and Chicago. Is it just Chicago right now? Yeah, it is just Chicago right now. Um, DC really work. One, one of the one of the strengths of the BGA, in my view, is our focus on Chicago and Illinois. 
I, I don't think we had the resources to run a national organization. Um, this happened before I, I was here and was shut down before I came to the BGA. Um, uh, Springfield is a different case. Uh, we last year received a, a $10 million commitment from the Robert R. R. McCormick Foundation to expand our reporting in a number of different ways in our investigative reporting and a new kind of journalism called solutions journalism that we'll be investing in as well. And as part of that, we intend to uh, re staff Springfield again with, uh, with investigative journalists. And we also have a plan to provide investigative reporting resources for newspapers across the state that longer have staffs that can do enterprising and investigative journalism. And we, we have a plan to work with these newspapers, have reporters available to them basically to do investigative reporting. And that, that, that effort uh, and the Springfield expansion, uh, as well as the Solutions Journalism will, will be funded by this big grant from the McCormick Foundation. Well, let's drill down on, on the reporting piece because I'm really interested in just the notion of nonprofit news. And tell us a little bit about how it is different from you know, for-profit news, you know, the more traditional model, you know, how it's different. And then also specifically, I mean, I think you have about a team of about 10 reporters. How do you decide what stories to go for, uh, what collaborations to develop? Is that like each individual reporter might have a colleague at the Trade Tribune and sometimes they decide to collaborate on something. So if you could talk just kind of broadly about nonprofit news, how it works, the credentialing piece, and then, then specifically about how you uh, your team does its work. Yeah, sure. Um, nonprofit news uh, is different. It, in my observation, it, it's not necessarily by design, uh, but it's almost by necessity that nonprofit news tends to be very focused, much more so than a daily newspaper has been. The daily newspaper was designed to basically serve all readers in any of their interests across the board from government to entertainment, to business, to sports. Nonprofit news tends to be focused on what they think is, uh, is an audience that has a specific interest. And so uh, here in Chicago, you, you have Block Club Chicago that is out in the neighborhoods, very, very street level reporting, really at a level that's even the Tribune and Sun-Times at the height of their powers didn't put as many people out on the streets all day long as Block Club currently is doing. You have Injustice Watch, which focuses exclusively on the court system and accountability in the court system. The Better Government Association does investigative reporting about government. Um, you, you, you can go on and on. The South Side Weekly is focused only on the South Side. A group called The Tribe is really focused on uh, a, 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 a Black readership and issues affecting the Black community. Um, and, and so um, we kind of each pick and choose our, our lanes. And I think by necessity, because we don't have the financial resources that legacy news organizations historically did, if we wander too far away, we're going to run out of money pretty fast. And so there's an, an, an imposed discipline. The great thing that we have going on in Chicago is that there are so many uh, really strong nonprofits organizations run by journalists with serious credentials who are recruiting some serious reporters. We have on our staff, David Jackson, who won a Pulitzer Prize and was a four-time Pulitzer finalist. We have Dave Kidwell, who is, a, is also a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, but we also have people who are fairly new to journalism and are learning investigative journalism from the ground up. And most nonprofit news organizations have their doors open to both types sort of out of the city news model in a way, you know, giving people a start in the career because uh, they, you know, sometimes the, the starting pay is a little lower than legacy newsrooms. We actually pay a competitive salary because in order to get reporters who can do investigative journalism, you have to compete. And the other thing going on is that we all look to each other as prospective partners. We compete, we compete as aggressively as the old legacy model. But we also are open-minded about doing journalism with other news organizations in order to share resources where one plus one often equals three uh, because we've got expertise in-house. Some other news organization might have expertise in-house. In the case of that fires investigation, uh, you know, the, the Tribune had graphics capabilities the BGA does not have. The BGA has database capability that the Tribune 
has but wasn't focused where we were focusing. Uh, the Tribune's reporter was really great with an empathetic interview. Our reporter was in, in world class in like that tough, hard nosed government interview. So you mix that all up and you get, actually get the best possible story and you just unleash resources. We did an investigation of the Alderman Ed Burke with the BGA and WBEZ. We put basically the two best investigative political reporters in the city on that story. We could not have done that in the old model of every news organization works in only its own silo and doesn't join forces with with others. And, and so um, that's a, that's both nonprofit per se, but also the current state of journalism, uh, at least in the city of Chicago. And like, would you a reporter come to you and say, hey, I need, you know, six months to look into. I know you did a big piece on waste and fraud at O'Hare. I mean, I'm a, as a former reporter, I'm sure you wouldn't go to your boss and say, I need six months. But just say, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I envision a very wide ranging investigation of, say, O'Hare. Uh, can I go for it? And you say, you know, do what it takes to, to do it right. That's essentially the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of our really big stories have come out of um, sort of brainstorming sessions where what the challenge we put to the staff is think of the best possible story you can do if you are not constrained by resources. What is the best story out there? And 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 you cut the reporters when they're given that prompt, they come up with some really ambitious ideas. That O'Hare story came out of that brainstorming session. The Ed Burke story I talked about came out of that brainstorming session. The fire story actually had it at its genesis in a brainstorming session like I just described. And so that's one way we do it. And one one of the one I, I guess attribute that sets us apart is is, a, is if a reporter says to me, I'm going to do this project and I think it might take whatever it is, six months, 12 months, even more sometimes. If we see the vision for the story and we see that that investment of time is can be a good investment, we green light the story. What I always talk to my editors about is that decision about green lighting a story, especially in our model, is the most decision that important decision that we make. Because when we green light a story like that, we're green lighting a reporter and other colleagues spending a year and more on a story. So we have to be very thoughtful. It has to be a great idea. We have to see that it's obtainable. We have to see that the, the the stakes are high enough to justify that kind of investment. But if all that adds up, then uh, then we go ahead and do it. Well, you did a, a, a multi-episode podcast on Speaker Madigan. I think it was called Madigan, Madig the Madigan Rule or Madigan Rule. Talk the about Madigan that, Rule. what the backstory was, what you were trying to accomplish in this uh, in this work of journalism. Right. Um, as we are looking to the future of journalism, uh, and we are very focused on how do people get their news, and uh, it doesn't do us a lot of good to publish stories that nobody reads or hears or sees. Uh, and obviously, news consumption habits are changing a lot. Podcasting is becoming a way that people learn a lot about what's going on in the world today. And I wanted to, I had it in the back of my mind. Um, uh, that we ought to at least experiment to see if we could do a well-produced multi-episode podcast. Anybody can do stick a mi microphone in, two, in front of two people in a studio and have them talk. Not everybody can do a well-produced multi-episode series. That that was the question on the table. And so we, um, uh, then the question was, well, what's a, what's a story worthy of that kind of investment? And the Madigan... Mike Madigan, the, the House Speaker for a quarter century in the state of Illinois, was at that point under investigation. He had not yet been indicted. Uh, but the whole sweeping public corruption investigation was very well uh, in evidence. And we also knew that the Madigan story was a little more complicated than just the corruption that, that surrounded him. Uh, and, and so we decided this was a nuanced and important story that would lend itself really well to an auditory experience. Um, it fit right into our legacy you see, of deep dive investigative work. But um, uh, we we thought it, it it just it merited the the sort of podcast treatment. And uh, 
Uh, we, we work with Justin Kaufman, who is a radio producer I've worked with for years. I have great respect for his talents as a journalist. Uh, he did a sensational job. He got all of the former governors except Rob Blagojevich. Uh, and frankly, we sort of made a decision to not try very hard for Blago. We weren't that interested in what he had to say. Um, uh, and he got a lot of people right up close to Madigan, uh, both critics and fans. And I think we told a, a, a multifaceted story that uh, has great consequence for the state of Illinois. David, you have another publication, which I saw on your website, which is a um, a kind of a thought piece on the, the issue of ranked choice voting, which many people think could be critical to our, you know, the health of our democracy going forward. To talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's sort of a, kind of in a different genre of sort of an explainer. And as I read it, I thought it was a very fair minded description of what it is and then also the, the the pluses the minuses the historical record you know what its possible future might be talk a little bit about that project yes um uh our policy team often focuses on pretty narrow and technical policy issues we have you and i speak uh, city council is meeting over an ethics reform package that the bga helped to the BJ's policy team helped to um, author for uh, alder person Michelle Smith, who's the head of the city council ethics committee. We get in the weeds and do that kind of work on the policy side. The journalists, of course, are objective, uh, completely fact-based. They, the two operations function completely independently of one another. Um, but on the policy side, we do apply journalistic uh, tactics to a lot of the work we do. Besides the in the weeds work that we do. We also, from time to time, we we write position papers uh, with with regard to the government, the federal corruption case in Illinois. We wrote a lengthy, we proposed a lengthy 15 part statewide ethics reform package, which uh, was uh, about a 2,500 word piece that was soup to nuts. Here's how Illinois could be better. And from time to time, we take a look at specific issues that we don't necessarily take a policy position on, but we think it's important enough that people have, that we want to expose people and help them better understand if they're hearing talk about this. And voting, uh, voting uh, over the course of 2020 and, and a little bit afterward, uh, voting access was really important, uh, and the ranked choice voting issue sort of a national topic of conversation. And in the back of our policy director's mind, in the back of my mind, there are questions about whether ranked choice voting has applications potentially, especially in the city of Chicago, which has a nonpartisan primary and ranked choice voting might actually be useful in this context. New York was experimenting with ranked choice voting. So we thought, well, there are probably are really good lessons to be learned from what New York did. And, and with sort of a, a, a an early step into is this something the BJ ought to weigh in on, make a policy recommendation on. And so in order to kind of really study up and not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the community, we we do that in a journalistic way. We report it out and we publish. And, and I think that that piece we published, I'm glad you noticed it. I think it was one of the more thorough and thoughtful uh, pieces I've seen published on, on the New York experience in ranked choice voting and the implications of that experience or other cities and states that might be considering that approach to voting. Well, you've talked about the wall between your journalistic entity and then your public policy advocacy. Does it sometimes happen that, you know, investigative piece might, you know, create some ideas that your, your public policy advocacy piece picks up on? I mean, I understand why they need to be separate operations, but are there examples where, you know, some real good investigative reporting leads to some ideas on the other side of the the curtain uh yeah the, there are and 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 it can work that way um let me just take a step back john uh it's really important to understand kind of the rules of the road here and frankly when i came to the bga in 2018 it was a little bit muddled and i spent a good part of my first year at the bj really clarifying exactly what the rules of the road are now and they we have them written down. They are official policies and procedures of the BGA. 
and we share them with anybody who has any interest, including publishing partners who have, have an interest in knowing. Um, our journalism is completely objective and independent of any of the policy work that we do. And um, if we do our job right, a great investigative piece doesn't really need much policy advocacy because some public official somewhere will pick it up and, and run with it. And, and that happens quite often it, with the reporting that we do. Um, it happened with the fire story, it happens with others. Um, but sometimes we publish something and not much happens. And yet it's a pretty important finding. And, um, and in that instance, the policy team can look at something that, that's there, it's been published, it's there for any reader to see, it's on our website. And if the, public, if the policy team thinks, you know, something ought to be done, them to decide. They don't consult with the editors about it. They, you know, they both work in the same separate parts of the same office. Uh, they're, you know, if they run into each other at the coffee machine, they're, they're perfectly collegial with each other, but they do not collaborate in any way. I'm the only person at the BJ who has a foot in both camps. I direct the work of both groups, but I'm very mindful of, since I'm a, sort of a, an author of this, these rules of the road, I'm very mindful of them. And, and it's so important our journalism be and be perceived as being completely objective, and it is. Um, and yet the policy team or something just because the BGA published it. And just to, just to keep going with the fires example, Mayor Lightfoot published a kind of half measure of reform after, after, right before we published our investigation, she knew based on all the questions going to City Hall, what our findings were. And she tried to come out ahead of the story. That's one of the oldest trick politician playbook. Um, but it was really a, a weak measure of reform. And we did an, an investigative report about her reform that said, hey, this is a really weak measure of reform. That was all just purely the journalistic part. We got a call from an older person right after the story was published saying, hey, I, I'm gonna hold hearings, I'm gonna do something, but that sort of moved on to other stuff and really not much beyond what Lightfoot did, which was better than nothing, but not very good. Um, it's kind of sat since then. We believe people are still dying from fires that from the same sorts of problems that we identified. And so now our policy team is kind of saying, hey, nothing has happened. Maybe we should circle back on this issue. It's important enough that it won a Pulitzer Prize. Maybe we should circle back and, and, and start generating interest in city city council to kind of make some real reforms happen. To me, that's entirely appropriate as long as we and, and outside stakeholders understand where what the rules are. And uh, it is a way that that the BGA uniquely can be a real uh, a, a real um, kind of catalyst for meaningful reform in a way that a standard journalism organization may not be. We, in another part of your life is you have a, a monthly column in the Tribune, which, you know, is connected to your work, of course. And uh, as I went through your columns, you know, lots of wonderfully interesting stories about Chicago politics. Obviously, the crime is such a huge issue now. Um, but, I, but one article I was struck with, and it, this came out, I think, in February, where you, I think, basically were, were ahead of the curve on the the uh, decision by Ken Griffin to uh, bankroll, I guess, the candidacy of Mayor Irving in um, in Aurora. You wrote an article, and then you have an extensive Q and A in uh, on your uh, your website. Tell us a little bit about the backstory there. I mean, did did Griffin kind of approach you and say, hey, I have something that you might want to go with or tell a little bit about that story? Yeah, one of the privileges of my job is I keep I get to do I did I do actually every other week for the Tribune and um, I still get to write columns with the, the column writing is, is one of the one of the I spent a lot of time at the Tribune, the better part of 10 years writing columns. I wrote a column for the Sun-Times early in my career. I've always liked column writing. I wanted to get into journalism because I grew up reading Mike Royko. Um, and so the fact that I still get to write a column and, and, and still kind of get to run around with a notebook in my pocket just really connects me to the roots of my career and, and fulfills me personally and professionally in ways that other parts of my work, um, you know, let's, let's say it just adds to the fulfillment of my job. Uh, uh, but but um, I, as a journalist, um, I, uh, I had done a story about 
uh, Griffin and an appearance that he made at the Economic Club where he was really the issue of violence and how uh, how it was really eroding the social contract in the city and, and the state. Um, and he was quite direct about it. And so I wrote a column about that. And in the writing of that column, um, I did a, a fair amount of reporting. I, I believe a good column reported. Um, I do a fair amount of reporting. It doesn't always show up in quotation marks, but it informs what I write. And I had dealt with, uh, with some of Griffin's people and it, along with many others outside that world uh, in, in reporting that column. Uh, everybody knew that at some point Ken Griffin was going to back somebody for governor. And, and so I just said, I said, you know, where, where do y'all stand on that? And, and just started asking open questions about where they stood, what the process was going to be, et cetera. I expressed interest in it. I said, you know, I'd be interested in sort of knowing what's going on and writing about it at some point. I continued as any good reporter will. I just, here's the city news thing. We talk about city news. City News, you went to work and you had to call every police district headquarters once an hour at late at night, once an hour to say, hey, anything going on? Any news? Any interesting crime I should be writing about? A beat check is something you ought to keep doing even when you're writing a column for the Chicago Tribune. And so I just every few weeks I would call in and say, hey, what's going on? You know, haven't heard much. Just checking in. And uh, they, I guess, discovered that I really had a sincere interest in what was going on. And so when they were ready to make the uh, announcement, they, they, they called me and said, Hey, we're, we're about to make the announcement. Would you be interested in talking to Ken Griffin? And, and so that's how, that's how that happened. Um, in the context of what we said about nonprofit journalism, you'll, you may be interested to know that we then had uh, one critic in particular say, Oh, look, Ken Griffin, he gives money to the, BGA and therefore the BGA is in his pocket, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, um, yes, Ken Griffin on and off has given money to us over the years, but you know what? So has a gentleman by the name of J.B. Pritzker. Um, he's given us actually more money <laughs> than Ken Griffin has. Uh, it used to be that you had to worry about advertising, advertising influencing coverage when you were at a legacy news organization. Today, you have to be aware, the, our journalists, they were aware they could, like anybody else, they can look on our website and see who funds us and who doesn't. But you just have to ignore the money side of it, and you just you be a good journalist and be objective and do and skeptical and and careful in your reporting. And um, and so I, I was I was bemused by the oh look Griff, Griffin gives money because Pritzker gave more, and we're just independent journalists doing our jobs. Okay. Well, let's talk about Illinois' political culture. And uh, and I was going back through some files in my office, and I, I, I re remembered that a decade ago, the Institute did this, you know, couple day symposium on the political culture of Illinois and, you know, commissioned dozens of papers and really interesting, thoughtful uh, analysis. And I mean, <laughs> it seems like everyone is asking the sort of fundamental questions, probably the same ones that we asked a decade ago. Is there something really distinctly corrupt about Illinois' political culture? I mean, are we really that different from other states? If so, what caused it? And I guess the big question is, you know, are there examples in which political entities have fundamentally changed their political culture on the positive side? I mean, what is the path to, to, to getting Illinois in a better place? So take a crack at those questions. Your last question, you put your finger on something really important, and I'll circle back to that in, in, in a little bit. But let me first answer the first part of your question first. I think about this a lot, and I talk to people a lot about it. Um, uh, there is something about the culture of corruption that is undeniable about the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Um, a lot of it has to do with our tolerance for conflicts of interest that are not the case in, in other uh, areas, specifically uh, the fact that Ed Burke in Chicago and Michael Madigan as Speaker of the House uh, in Illinois were two of the leading real estate uh, tax appeal lawyers in, in the state. Their firms rank in the top five every year. 
uh, creates evident conflicts of interest that we have tolerated for way too long. And that's not the only aspect of the culture uh, here in Chicago, here in, in Illinois. You know, the, the, way, the, the way that Madigan over time accreted his hold on power, uh, when you allow one person to hold that much power for that long, you're going to have compromises, et cetera, that, that are just going to happen. And, and just to, when you look at the allegations in the Commonwealth Edison corruption scandal, we, we thought we wiped out patronage, right? We passed laws to say you can't do patronage in the old old school way. Look, we wiped our hands. We, we've, we've eliminated patronage. Well, it turns out, allegedly, patronage is exercised by a friend of the speaker calling one of the major utilities in town and saying, hey, you, you know, you, I, you might need some help on this legislation. I know, you know, my friend, i.e. Mike Madigan, allegedly, uh, he's got some people who could use jobs, you know, could you, could you maybe give a couple of these people lobbying jobs? Uh, they may not show up to work, but that's okay. Whatever. I mean, that happens allegedly um, a culture of corruption. And, and so it, you know, fixing corruption in Illinois uh, will require a change in the culture. And one of the most disappointing aspects of uh, the aftermath of this huge corruption scandal is how tepid uh, governmental response has been. Governor J.B. Pritzker ran as an ethics reformer. He was basically a no-show in the when the major ethics reform package was being considered. He signed a law and declared victory on, on a reform that was really just not of the up to the measure of the moment for reform. And so we missed a moment. Uh, so that there's a tolerance for corruption here. Uh, and, and, and Governor Pritzker, he had he had super majorities in both houses. He had would have had support had he chosen to take some political risks in favor of ethical ethics reform. Uh, now he was fighting COVID during this time. He had other things on his mind, so I have to give him that. But um, it would have been great if he had made room for doing way way more. Uh, he seems to have presidential aspirations. This would have been a really good calling card. Now he won't have it as he considers whether he wants to run for uh, president. So um, now as to how do we fix it? I don't have an easy answer. There aren't easy answers. Um, what we're doing about it is this launch into the solutions journalism. And the idea of solutions journalism is uh, you, you apply the same rigor that you apply to investigative reporting to problems in government uh, to finding out what has been tried elsewhere or what's been tried locally, uh, and really, does it really work? It is, is are the reforms that have happened really as good as the press releases claim they are? And when you're skeptical, data-centric reporters find that in fact this stuff works, you write about it. That's where the that's where the solutions journalism ends. It's it's objective, fact-based journalism, just like regular investigative journalism. At the BJ, then, if we want to, if the policy side wants to pick up some of those ideas once we published, they they can do that. And this investment in solutions journalism, I think, is one factor that can help us get out of uh, this kind of uh, wash, rinse, repeat cycle on corruption, financial mismanagement, and some of the other significant the, the crime issue. Uh, so some of the other significant issues facing the state. Great. David, we've had some good questions emailed in. And the first one comes from Sarah in Carbondale, who says, it seems like the BGA has a heavy focus in Chicago. Should the people in su Southern Illinois send you leads for local stories? So maybe broaden that out and talk about how you, <laughs> excuse me, how you like to, um, how you're able to cover other parts of uh, the kind of good government quest uh, in other parts of the state. Yeah, I, I, I will plead guilty of an overly Chicago focused. Um, if somebody looks at the at our work and says, you, you all focus a lot on Chicago, I, I plead guilty to that. And it's something that we need to, uh, we need to amend over time. And I'm really happy that we will have the resources now to really intentionally and consistently focus on statewide issues in a way Previously, we just haven't had the resources for that. This is happening at a time of the breakdown. I mean, the the, the local newspapers in 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 
uh, the cities across the state are suffering really, really serious cutbacks and, and really a disappearance of investigative reporting in a lot of those places. We will be able to provide resources for that purpose. And we really need to because Chicago is not the only story in the state of Illinois. There are statewide issues having to do with, with, with education, with justice, with health and safety, uh, issues that affect everyday lives. And we have to, have to do a better job of, of covering them, especially because the, the newspapers in the, in the cities statewide have been so hard hit by the decline of legacy media. You got a, a question or a comment from Leonard from Godfrey, Illinois, who notes that he was a BGA intern uh, in the early 70s, mid 70s. He was a student at Knox College. I went there as well. And he was saying that he would spent some time uh, in Springfield just plowing through records. And he said this was a good lesson to the value of seemingly small re records undercovering a larger story. Talk a little bit about just um, maybe your approach to kind of digging, investigative reporting, and also the data journalism. You've made a couple of references to that. Kind of hone in on exactly what that means. Sure, and and before I get into that, I just wanna say, Leonard, uh, thank you for uh, caught the shout out to the internship, uh, the long legacy of great intern work that's been done at the BJ, and that's something else we're trying to build back up. We We've had some good success, but we need to go bigger on that. That's an active topic of conversation. And I've run across, currently my my pastor is a former BGA intern, one of our board members. We've had two board members in the last years who have both been BGA interns. I run into people all the time who did internships at the BGA. So great to hear from you, Leonard. Um, uh, but as, as far as the data work, I mean, when I was at Reuters, the, the investigative editor there and I developed a pretty good relationship and and, and he, he talked about when you started talking about an 18 month investigation, one of his questions was always, well, what is the moat around our story? In other words, if we're going to invest that kind of time, we've got to know that nobody else is going to do the story. We don't, you know, publish right at a week or two ahead of us. And we've invested 12 months in a story. Then, you know, it's arguable that was a wasted effort, possibly. One of the moats around our stories, one of the ways that we do something that nobody else is going to do is dig into the data. And, it's, and if you go back to that, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Thing. What people say is sort of a narrative around your story. It's, it makes it more readable, et cetera. If you don't have the data, you don't have a story. And, um, and one of the things we do exceptionally well, both is collect that data, but then organize that data in ways that deliver epiphanies for our reporters and ultimately for our readers. One of the real talents that we look for when we're recruiting is that facility with database work. And um, we also have people on staff who are full-time data specialists who, um, who work alongside uh, more traditional reporters. Uh, the data is, is needs to define, any, any good investigative journalism is defined largely by data at the end of the day, you know, you, you mentioned Cy Hirsch earlier. Well, his biggest early scoop was uh, the My Lai massacre in the Vietnam War days. And he tells this story, great story in his book about going to uh, a, an army, an, an army base and just driving around and just grabbing people and interviewing them. Uh, that's one way to get a story. It's harder to do these days than it used to be, but databases are always there. Data lives forever. And if you can find the right set of data, you can find a great story. Great. William from Chicago asked this question. He says, why do news organizations have, <coughs> pardon me, have to take legal means to open city, state, and federal books to report on news, newsworthy items that directly affects taxpayers? Why does local government always seem to hide meeting information from public view? Well, I mean, that's one of the great imponderable questions. Uh, but, but from what I can tell, there are several reasons. First of all, it, t it does take a lot of work to actually put that data out there, that information out there in a useful way. Uh, the city of Chicago, as an example, has built a pretty good crime dashboard that actually has some pretty good data in it. So I, I do wanna credit the, the, the efforts that some governments have begun to make to actually make that data, that data more accessible just to anybody who's interested to begin looking. Uh, but governments, 
the question is is right on target. Governments tend to be, they go to, into a defensive crouch off in the minute you file a Freedom of Information Act request. And um, journalists are not special when it comes to FOIA. We have the, our rights as journalists are identical to the rights of everybody on this call and everybody in this state and beyond. Um, we're the ones who decide, well, we're gonna make an issue out of this. And at the BGA, we uniquely decide that, you know, we're, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to sue you. <laughs> and so we, you know, when, when we start asking, uh, governments pretty quickly learn that we know what we're doing. We know the law. We have a, Matt Topic as our lawyer. He's probably the leading freedom of information lawyer in the state. And we keep coming and coming and coming at you. And unfortunately, that often is what it takes in order to get the information that they're called public records for a reason. We public own them. Our rights of access are very broad and the few exceptions are very narrowly defined. If you're not within those exceptions, we're going to go after it and we're ultimately going to get it. And one of the reasons we stayed in the Navy Pier case for seven plus years is that we stay in the game until we get the results that we are we are owed by the law. So yeah, it's too bad that um, governments don't see this as being part of their obligation to the public to serve the public interest by releasing data more readily in a more usable form. Uh, but um, we're working on that uh, to make it better and also to make certain that we get what we're owed. Okay. Well, David, let me ask you on kind of a lighter note, I mean, how do you like to relax? I mean, you're in pretty intense work between managing an important entity, doing your own writing. How do you like to unwind when, uh, when, when you have some time? It's funny you asked this. I had lunch with with somebody uh, yesterday, and we were talking about that very topic. Um, and uh, I my I, I have two main forms of relaxation, I guess. Uh, we lived in Atlanta for a while, and I learned that there's actually a season called spring. There there are things in your backyard called gardens, and so I learned a little bit about gardening back then, and I, I've stuck with that. Um, and my my main form of relaxation is bicycling, and I find bicycling not really great exercise and you get to get out and travel distances, but I do so much good. I, if this counts as relaxation, I do a lot of thinking about really tough problems at work when I'm riding a bike. And I, I clear up some of the greatest problems we face uh, when I'm just riding around the Skokie Lagoons up north of Chicago. Wow. Well, tell me a little bit about this book you wrote with your wife. Uh, and it seems like it's a little different or quite a bit different than your three other books. How did it come about and what was the uh, what was the, uh, the the net result? It was in a it was in a period when I was doing a lot of international travel and seeing um, uh, seeing, how, you know, just observing how children but children are different around the world as well. The toys they play with are quite a lot different and came up with this idea of uh, play, basically. Toys everywhere, it's called. And uh, we just kind of wrote about how toys, what toys look like and how they're used around the world. And, and it was written for a, 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 a child to, to read, to be just open their minds a little bit about, okay, you know, back Barbie dolls were still somewhat popular or or Cabbage Patch Kids, here's what, you know, here's the something that a child in India plays with. And just to open their minds a little bit about there are different ways of play. We all play, but we play in different ways. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was not a major project. It was just some fun for my wife and me. And, and we got it published as part of a, a children's book series. Oh, great. Well, let me ask you finally, we have, you know, some students on the call. And I, some, I like to end some of our interviews by saying, you know, if you were to advise a young person about to launch a career, um, what have you learned? What are the kind of central lessons that you have um, that you have picked up and and that you would urge younger people to think about as they prepare for professional careers? I think based on my experience, I, I would say, uh, especially in those early years, be be very flexible in thinking about what you want to do. I, I spent almost my entire life thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. I, I, in many ways, I think I, I would have enjoyed the law. I, the, the skills are quite transferable between journalism and, and law. But, but I guess 
I sort of trusted my gut when journalism called out to me and I had some great experiences early on and decided to stick with it. Part of that was, I think I had a pretty good sense of what I was good at or what I really liked doing. Ideally, what you like doing and what you're good at will be kind of in the same area. And, um, and so really some self-discovery about what really, what am I good at? And, and I like doing so much that I'm going to be the best among the best, whatever. I'm going to be very good at this. Because if you've got something you like and you're good at and you are good per se, when compared to others, you're going to have a lot of success. Um, I wasn't particularly motivated by money, but even in journalism, you can have a decent career. Uh, I have a, a daughter now who's kind of wrestling with this. She uh, went to NYU and studied playwriting and um, is still uh, still writing plays with people she went to school with. She's out of school about four years now. She's got a full-time job and that's becoming more and more demanding, but she's keeping that playwriting alive. And, and, and we have a, a father-daughter chat once in a while and I just keep encouraging her. It's like, Claire, follow your... Follow your heart with your playwriting. I mean, once once you give it up, if you do, it's going to be hard to get to get back. So just keep following that because you have the talent, and you've got to work on making it work. And and so I, I would just say, follow your brain, follow your heart. Be too motivated by money, money will take care of itself if you find something that really fulfills you and that you're good at. Great. Well, David, thank you for really a terrific discussion. This was a lot of fun. And uh, again, I've heard about the BGA and really respect the work that you do. And, uh, you know, I've loved reading your writing and would love to keep in touch and perhaps coax you down to Carbondale to meet with students and the community here. And maybe you can find some stories that might, uh, might be worth the BGA uh, pursuing at some point down the road. Well, I've got a lot of admiration for, for the Institute and, and uh, I checked into your background a little bit, John, you and I have a fair amount in common. We, we've had a lot of uh, journalism in our backgrounds and interest in international relations, et cetera. I, I, I'd i love to to kind of keep connected BJ and the, and uh, the, the Simon Institute. And um, it won't be that hard to get me to come down to Carbondale. It's a beautiful part of the state. And, uh, it's I, I get to Springfield several times a year. It's not that much further to get down to Carbondale. And there's some great biking too. So we I will... was about to say that I didn't, I didn't want to be self-indulgent. <laughs> Besides the road rides, I really like mountain biking too. And there's some great mountain biking down that way. <laughs> we'll find some biking opportunities for you. So David, thank you so much. It was really fun. Thank you, John. Thanks. And thanks for your listeners. Bye-bye. Great. And thanks to all you for watching this uh, interview. We'll have it on our uh, YouTube channel tomorrow. Please show it family, friends, and thank you for supporting the Institute, keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.